In this episode, you're going to learn how to harness the ever-expanding nature of service design as a discipline without going totally mad. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Clara. This is the Service Design Show, episode 144. Hi, I'm Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden things that make the difference between success and failure, all to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and planet. Our guest in this episode is Clara Lamas, who's currently a business design director at Veritier. And in this episode, we're going to address what to do about the fact that our current service design tool set isn't enough. We need a wider variety of people and skills to be involved in order to deliver great services. But this begs the question, where does the role of a service design professional stop? It's already hard enough to grasp all the existing aspects of service design, let alone that you now also need to know about things like organization design as well. But there is no denying service design needs to expand its borders in order to deliver on its promise. We need to start breaking down the silos that we unintentionally have formed over the years. So in this conversation, we're going to discuss how you can foster collaboration and create bridges between service design and other disciplines, which allows you to share the workload and responsibility of delivering great services. If you enjoy topics like this and want to grow as a service design professional, make sure you click that subscribe button because we bring a new video like this every week or so. Well, that about wraps it up for the introduction. Now it's time to jump into the conversation with Clara Lamas. Welcome to the show, Clara. Thanks for having me, Mark. Thanks a lot. Yes, uh, happy to have you on. Excited to talk about the topic that we have uh, scheduled for today. Uh, but as always, Clara, we start with the question. Uh, if you could do a brief introduction, who are you and what do you do these days? So my name is Clara Yamas. I'm the director of business design at an agency called Veritier. We are um, working with rather large um, companies on transformation through design and um, also delivery. And my background is as a cultural anthropologist. After that, I was working in industry for a number of years and I came into service design in mid-career um, and have been working as a service designer for the last four years. Mm. As an anthropologist, that's an interesting uh, background to have as a service designer. Uh, I, I absolutely can see how uh, it's relevant. Um, and we'll get to your service design bit in a second because uh, we have the 60 second question rapid fire round. Five questions. Uh, your task is to answer them as quickly as possible. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. Clara, what's always in your fridge? Milk. All right. Uh, which books or books are you reading at this moment, if any? I just started Capitalism Without Capital, which is kind of um, showing us a transition of thinking in just assets and um, how the world is transforming to digital value or non-capital value. It's fascinating, but I've just started, so that's all I can say. All right. We'll add a link to the show notes. Um, what was your first job? Oh, my first job. I think it was picking up um, glasses around my parents' house after their parties. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, what did you want to become when you were a kid? I think I wanted to become a doctor. Mm. Just, okay. you know, help people be, be well and fix things. Mm. Well, you're still doing that, hopefully, as a service <laughs> designer in a different way. Now, you already mentioned something about your transition into service design, but I'm curious, do you remember the very first time you got in touch with service design? Yeah, it's interesting. So I think it's when I was living in Helsinki, I was working as a, as a freelance consultant and I became interested in service marketing. So I started to read about services marketing and, and started to develop a sort of, I don't know, emergent interest in the discipline. I didn't know what service design was at that time. It was maybe like uh, 11 years ago. 
And I think it was through that. So through services marketing, reading a very big, heavy book on services marketing. <laughs> uh, heavy books, uh, those are usually very good. Um, <laughs> awesome. Um, so um, when we were chatting uh, prior to this conversation, you said it might be interesting to talk about the expanding boundaries of service design as a practice. Uh, we'll mm. dig into that uh, a little bit deeper. But I'm curious, how did you arrive at this topic? Hmm. It's a good question. And I think it's related to maybe um, coming to service design after having been in industry and in research for, for, for more than a decade. I understood that there is a lot of the methodology and the sort of approaches that service design uses that go beyond the type of work that, that we would be doing as an agency. And it was almost a, a thought around um, if you turn the focus of service design to other things, so other design elements like the organization itself, et cetera, then maybe, maybe it works. Maybe you can do something that goes beyond designing the service. And a lot of the kind of elements or principles and, and uh, qualities of, of service design as a discipline, as we know it now, would be applicable. And also there was an element of just like playing around with the discipline. So if the discipline is so young and it's not kind of a solid state thing, then how can we a little bit continue to transform it and expand it? And, you know, can it do different things for us? So I think that was like the, the genesis of all that. And I was very lucky to be on, on a really long term project in capability building at that time. So that helped me to gave me time and opportunity to explore this um, rather than just being, you know, full on project work. Um, I think that's that's kind of the genesis of, of that one. All right. <clears throat> so there is an implicit uh, assumption here. And um, I would say it's true that we currently have formed boundaries. Uh, within or around service design, let's let's try to sort of um, dig into that. How would you describe the the boundaries that you see in service design? Ah, wow. So I will say what I see, which could be completely wrong, and someone else can come along and say something totally different. But what I saw as a practitioner is, first of all, there was a very kind of almost narcissistic point of view around the way we use our tools and the tools we use and sort of coming from a social science education background and coming from doing strategy and and different type of work in in um, innovation research i was like but nothing is truly original it's a discipline that borrows from so many others and it, it takes so much thing things from social science sometimes depending what kind of environment of service design you're in it might be more or less technology averse or friendly and oriented. So I just had this feeling that um, that it's not set in stone. We can um, decide how we use the discipline, but it's also something about, um, oh my God, I just completely lost the question mark. Well, the question was, what are the boundaries? Which boundaries do you see? Ah, okay, yeah. So I was thinking more around the, the boundaries are more self-imposed. And sometimes they are just related to the fact that we are not necessarily uh, experimenting with other disciplines. How might we collaborate with others around us? So I'm encountering a lot of this now in terms of you know, setting up a, a service design practice in a large organization, which has also all kinds of other disciplines or capabilities being set up. For instance, it can be a, you know, agile product development or, or scaled agile and so on. So it's almost more around what are these kind of APIs that we need to build to other bits of the business to make the methods work and then do the methods need adjustment. So how do we translate that? Mm. <clears throat> so I, I've been having a lot of conversations over the years about boundaries and uh, defining a discipline. Um, <clears throat> at some points, it's really useful to have a sort of a common agreement on what something is because it allows new people to get into the discipline faster. You can actually write a book about it and say, like, here's the thing we as a community do as practitioners. And um, when it becomes bigger uh, and fuzzy and uh, the, the term that every designer loves, which is 
it depends. Um, we we lose uh, we lose some other qualities. Like I'm I'm curious, how do you how do you see that uh, that balance? Can we still expand uh, the boundary of service design while still being a discipline which is which Self new people pay. well which new people can uh, access or will it become yeah. so fuzzy that it's like that nobody uh, yeah. even knows what it means yeah i don't i think that it's not so service design one of its qualities actually is that it's highly structured it's facing it's structured so i don't necessarily feel that you need fuzziness i think everything can fit perfectly well into a grid it's absolutely fine and everything can be decomposed so I think it's not so much about fuzziness, but I do think there's something about, you know, tools, not rules. So it's almost like, give me a framework and then I will work within the boundaries of that framework rather than tell me how to do it. And I believe that's that's more to the ethos of, of maybe human-centered design, but it's also to the ethos of we do need boundaries, but we don't need, need to be told how to do things. And then... At the end of the day, you know, you can go from a kind of level one of things, which is everything. And we, we say we want to be holistic and we want to understand the human experience, the lived experience. But if you start decomposing that into like granularity, you, you can also do that. And there is a trace. So I think maybe that's where that's where, you know, there there is a grid and then depends of how how much of the grid you want to cover but you can always trace things down like ladder things down so uh, and, uh, i'm curious how do you see like what are the things that we should still embrace uh what are the key elements that that are sort of uh, that are the key nature of service design and what are those things that we where we can seek uh, expansion where we can seek inspiration yeah. with and from other disciplines maybe yeah, so when I went into service design as a practitioner for the first time, I was working only in a service design organization. So we were all service designers in our in our group. And then others outside the group, so always on client side, were not. And that was interesting for me in the sense of, okay, this is perfect because I want to get better at doing the doing and being with service designers. Like everybody knows more than me. Everybody has been doing it for longer than me. So that was extremely useful but then if you need to sort of integrate points of view so to be empathetic actually it's part of our it should be one of our qualities as service designers but sometimes sometimes actually we are not and i would say even beyond empathy we might need to be compassionate sometimes and other times it's sort of not to be so principled about what we call things so let ourselves merge into the local language, you know, integrate the local language. And one thing I've found more recently working in teams where on our side, so on the agency side, we are multidisciplinary, working with a lot of people who come from management consultancy or people who come from technology and so on, is this a um, lot of product owners. This sort of how do we cross-pollinate these points of view and learn to work across tribes, so not be tribal in our practice and be be generous in, you know, allowing to call things by different names as long as we understand those boundaries. I think. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ma makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm curious, like, if you you've been thinking about this, you've been experiencing this firsthand. If you trace the story back, like, how did we get here? Because you said service design is a relatively young discipline, and it, it is, um, and still you experienced a tribal nature. So how did we get here so soon? Well, maybe the, maybe it's not soon, maybe it's right, because it's almost like it's kind of like this hype, no? There is a moment where you are very self-righteous when you're an adolescent and then you mature and you're not so self-righteous. So I almost feel like if you think of it of a human life cycle, it's a little bit like that. No, now we are like, we need to prove ourselves. You know, we are the, you know, we, we exist, we are here, we need to make, our name be heard. We need to give ourselves an entity because it's a new profession. So when I was studying at uni, this, this thing didn't exist. You know, there was maybe like Shostak's article in 84. I don't know. So I think, I think maybe that's, that's that, that kind of energy comes from that. And I think it makes a lot of sense. 
and it's good for, you know, when you start and, and you need to build a basis. So, you know, you, you have kind of some stability, but I think in, in the practice, we still have a lot of room to, to move things forward. So it doesn't mm. only have to be in, in innovation labs or in academia. I think practitioners have a big opportunity to kind of move the dial just by, by doing. Yeah. So, and I, I, I totally see the same way for the same movement where you need like a, you need to build an identity in order to build critical mass and to uh, be heard, like put your name out there, like you said, like build an entity yeah. uh, and, and it helps to, to put a label on that entity. Um, and now it feels like we're reaching a new level of maturity as a, as an entire field where we can sort of step, step back and uh, still be doing service design without being so clinked to that identity and having yeah. to put our flag in the, in the ground, if, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I had a little experience actually last week around this. So I was creating a small training board around um, organizational scoping for client side. And then I got super excited about, oh, you know, the transition of, 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 um, of management in the 20th, 20th century and got into all this like stuff about your, your guest, Naomi Stanford, who is like a longtime hero of mine, um, about organizational design and how it can be more impactful and sort of or humanizing organizations. And then, and then I realized that the audience was like, I just want a method. I have a very specific problem that I need to deal with at work right now. I'm not sure how to go about it. Like, thanks for the, you know, for the context, but right now I just want a sort of recipe to conduct this work. And that would have been much more useful. So I thought, okay, it's a good learning that, you know, go and just do it once, do something. And then, and then you start to play around with how, other ways that you might do the thing, but it's sort of, you need to kind of anchor things somewhere and, and start practicing. And if you have too many options, so almost optionality is a hindrance rather than, than giving opportunities, depending on where you are in your development. Yeah. And, and now you're feeling that we are reaching the stage where optionality becomes more important. I guess, I mean, I don't want to pontificate, so I don't well, know it's, if, I'm, I'm asking if the for your experience. Yeah. But I but personally from my own personal experience definitely and I think I think it's it's nice to be brave about it. So I remember talking about you know organizational change what's the role of service design in organizational change. It can play a huge role but it it also depends if we as designers suddenly understand that the remit of our design is something else than we thought it was. So it's also for us to kind of embrace that. So um again i'm i'm tapping into your personal experience like how did that thinking change for you because apparently you had a perspective on what service design was or should be and that has shifted towards what it could be hmm. can you describe that shift yeah i think it's it's kind of my own um my own maturity i guess in the in the discipline so coming Coming from studying um, service design and innovation at UAL, start but but not doing it as a kind of young person, rather as a mid-career person who has kind of other things that they can bring along that they can transfer. Um, and I think it was more my early focus was just I just want to do the doing. I want to you know do customer journeys. I want to do contextual inquiry. I want to do interviews. I want to synthesize and understand how what how the process works and etc. And then I think after having been doing that for a while and sort of serendipitously landing on projects that were not exactly, you know, just service design projects or service improvement projects, but rather kind of a little bit fuzzy innovation projects or capability building projects. I think that's where it all started to be a bit more hmm, maybe there's something more that can be done with the discipline. Oh, but there is another discipline that already does that. And then you sort of, it's almost like you start to encounter, you know, you're sailing in the dark and you start like all the icebergs are starting to hit you. And then you're just kind of looking at them and, and dissecting them. And I felt, 
I suddenly started to feel that, oh, there are overlaps. There are things that, you know, you can apply ser- what are known as service design methods to in, you know, or design practice and so on. So I think it was, that was kind of my journey. It was a lot of luck just landing myself on projects that were of that nature and maybe my own background, just kind of asking those questions because I had done similar things using completely non-design approaches, if Hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, Yeah, so that it makes sense as uh, you encountered uh, challenges which weren't specifically about improving or creating a new service, right? That was, Absolutely. and, and I, <laughs> I've been in that situation as well. And then you sort of start to realize that service design or the approach, the methodology, the mindset, the attitude can be applied to many different problems. And, and it helps when you don't cling on to, I want to do specifically, I want to yeah. design a service or I want to improve a service. Um, now, now that you've been through this experience, which opportunities do you see for the field when we expand our our boundaries? What what's in store? Mm. Yeah, it's good because you don't want to be stepping on other people's toes, right? So you you still have a kind of remit. Um, I don't know. So. I, like this question is very provocative and I'm thinking now just just kind of reacting to it in, in the minute. I think there's two things. One is, um, is it design, you know? Like, because design is just like doing something deliberately, isn't it? It's, it's just not leaving things to chance. So then it starts to kind of go into this, this thinking of what is a service? Is a service like a distinct entity? Or are we actually designing parts of a service? And if, let's say, we go down the route of, let's call it design, so it's not service development or service architecting or service planning or some other thing that's not design, then how does it fit into a kind of ecosystem of other um, skills and capabilities? So I'm now thinking, um, when I was studying service design, my, the name of my master's degree was Service Experience Design and Innovation. But the year after, the name of the master's degree itself changed. So I, I then, at the present moment, we are working a lot on something we call comprehensive design. So it sounds probably a little bit pretentious, but the, the thinking is maybe this is just a, a class, uh, one more discipline that doesn't do too much on its own. But if you put it together in a kind of, you know, um, messy way with other disciplines, so almost, you know, mutually exclusive, but comprehensively exhaustive, then it, it adds a lot of value. And then that's kind of where that boundary setting exists. So it's like, what does, does the brand architect do something different than the experienced designer who does something different than the service designer? who does something different than, you know, the um, delivery manager and does something different than the product owner and so on. And then the focus would be rather sideways instead of about the discipline itself. So it's more around how do those capabilities orchestrate with each other to make good outcomes for business, for organizations, etc. cetera. Hmm. So what I'm hearing you say is uh, collaboration is key and looking across disciplines and craft is key. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's it's maybe very simplistic, but, um, yeah, but sure. yes, well, yeah, I think so. And um, that if we do that, it allows us to um, maybe share the workload of actually delivering the results because that was one of the things I was thinking while preparing this is a lot of service designers or service design professionals put a lot of weight on their shoulders of actually yeah. trying to put services out into the world while we've by now hopefully realized that not even an army of service designers can deliver a service. You need an organization to actually do that. Uh, so this would also hopefully free <laughs> the yeah. discipline of, of the of the load of, of trying to deliver these services, yeah, quote unquote, absolutely. on the road. Absolutely. 
absolutely and i remember um you you had this this discussion about or you have this uh, always this this quote around you know the, the example that is used of the cafeteria no the cafe why would i go to this or that and then you you mentioned that it's about service design and then it's like is it maybe it's about branding right like maybe it's like three steps before service design because they haven't even interacted with the service yet so maybe it's just like something appeals to them, you know, and that could be related to branding, to other things which are like pre-service. And then it's like, so how exactly as you say, if if this is like a chain of collaboration, where are we in it? And how do we make it effective when we go to others? Sort of, mm -hmm. yeah, that yeah. interface focus. So where are we in this chain if we if it is a chain? Yeah, I don't know. So if you ask me right now based on like the things we are experimenting with in our client cases and our in our internal work i would say that we are not always at the front so we are somewhere in the middle so if i'm thinking if if you think of uh, for example working with retailers or working with this kind of uh, we are working with a lot of brands who are um, old brands like legacy brands who are moving into the future in transition but also global so they have a a very high focus on brand architecture, brand identity, you know, aligning all this kind of transition into, into digital and omnichannel stuff into their existing legacy brands and evolving those brands. So I think maybe for, for a lot of um, customers, the entry point is not service, it's actually brand, brand values. So they might be selling the same things. We're selling shoes, we're selling, you know, um, grocery, we are selling cars, but, um, we are doing it in our way. There's something specific, which is very important about our own legacy and our own brand values and the way we do things. So maybe that's kind of the first point of entry for, for consumer facing brands, let's say. And then the services are something that's more architectural, which is around the how those things will be delivered. And it doesn't mean, you know, sometimes I, I encounter the situation where it's like, we must hoard everything. We must do the discovery. We must do the research. We must do the, it's like, why? You can outsource it from another department in your business who's just going to be laser focused on that and just get what you need from them as a service design team. So I'm just thinking, like, what does that look like when you sort of architect the organization to deliver um, on service design? And the more I see it now in this large uh, kind of global environments, the more I feel it's somewhere in the middle, but it's really instrumental because it holds it all together. And it also has this orchestrating role. So it's, you know, we show everyone where everything kind of sits on a grid so that nobody is operating in, in silos or in silence or not aligned to sort of laddering up what we were talking about before. There's like levels, levels of granularity. And part of our job is just to make everyone aware of the bigger picture, but then to also be able to zoom into their little part of the grid it's a bit of a fa -fa -fa, yeah. but yeah. well um i definitely recognize this and like having the overview and seeing the bigger picture and orchestrating those are all terms that i've been using for the last five years on the show as well i'm curious if you think that's maybe one of the problems so let me explain because <clears throat> we some we i'm talking about the community the discipline sometimes have the feeling that we hold the truth like we see the entire picture we we know how everything is connected or should be and uh, other people need to align with that and that maybe creates um a different uh, yeah a sense of responsibility a different uh hierarch hierarchical feeling um and, and that maybe also causes the hoarding that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen something similar? Yeah, that's a good one. So maybe this is, maybe I am myself being arrogant in that. I think, I don't think it's, um, maybe that's like a mindset thing. So it's also, it's almost like, I don't, you know, if you think of design as facilitation, yeah, service design as facilitation, it's almost like I actually don't hold the truth, but I'm going to help you build the scaffolding to put things in order. So it's not just like a mountain of stuff, you know, it's not like a pile of laundry. It's like everything is ordered in shelves and you know exactly how to trace things. I, I'm almost thinking of like business analysis tools, like traceability matrices and stuff like that. 
And then I just create this environment where actually, you know, things that the house is in order and you people can actually get more activated to do whatever it is that they need to do in their part of, of the business or the house. My 93 year old mother was um, very funny because she said to me, I think I understand what you are doing now. You are putting things in order. This is your job. This, this is what your profession does. It's putting things in order so that us, and she was referring to elderly people. So she was saying like, we're so neglected by society, et cetera, et cetera. So nothing new here. So that people like us can actually have experiences that, that are based on our own capabilities and our own handicaps of related to age and so on. And I really like that thinking of, of sort of putting things in order because I feel that's a big part of the job. But it doesn't mean we hold the truth. It just means that we help build scaffolding. Yeah, and and there's there's a there's a paradox or a challenge there because if you help to uh, build the scaffolding and make sense of the world and sort of see the bigger picture, and you are enabling the organization to make smarter decisions about where they are heading um, by by helping the organization to see the bigger picture. You also see the bigger picture, and yeah. and and it's really hard to separate. Oh, sorry, to separate those two things, like helping to build a big uh, bigger picture and saying, okay, that's just my role, and then not also feeling responsible for making sure that the bigger picture is actually followed up with. That's what I've been seeing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But maybe there's and, some letting go that we need to do there. Yeah, absolutely, and maybe maybe it's like. Um, Maybe also part of that, like letting go is, is nice. It's a good way of, of putting it because it's almost like, you know, when you kind of grow in, in your career and you go to a management position and it's like, you don't do the doing anymore. Now you do something else, right? Like you get work done through others. So, so the, the, so the saying goes, so I was thinking maybe, maybe there's something about that. So it's almost like, you know, the kids are growing up and then you are, you are like, okay, now they can do it on their own. And then they let it go. So it's like, I, if I can just help others see that this, you know, way of structuring things and organizing helps them do their job better, but also gives them oversight of the bigger picture, like some kind of situatedness, that's already such a kind of critical role. And that that should be like a reward in itself. I might be getting a bit metaphysical here, but I well, think it's, yeah. It's a, yeah. Yeah, I... I uh... Yeah, I, I get that, and uh, I often have used the metaphor of being an, uh, an orchestra orchestrator in front of an orchestra. Um, now that I'm thinking of it, that that metaphor works in a lot of situations, but it's also flawed because there is just one person orchestrating the entire thing, uh, while that's not per se the role we want to have. Uh, yeah. We want to help everybody understand what they need to do without, without having the burden or the task or the responsibility. It needs to be a shared responsibility yeah. to guide everything in uh, in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> if we make a, a leap into, okay, let's say that that's um, the case and that we see this opportunity. What do you feel is currently missing? Which gaps do we need to bridge in order to mm. uh, get to this situation? Yeah, so one thing I find um, is that, and we, we talked about this also a lot with, with the, our professors at, at, at UAL, and one thing is sort of designers being interested in numbers, just like general, like PL stuff, you know? <laughs> oh, what is PL? But, you know, like being interested in, in the kind of drivers of business because public sector or private sector are always driven. Everybody has a PL, right? And that's, that's a huge part of the work we do is to be within those boundaries, to help improve to a certain extent. Oftentimes we are brought into businesses actually to help things, horrendous things like, you know, headcount reductions and so on. Yeah. So I think one is kind of, Numeracy, just being more interested in business models and how businesses really work and what are the kind of business drivers. Uh, and this applies to the NHS as much as it applies to a bank, I believe. And then another one is, is maybe just having more of an inquisitive mindset about, about collaboration. 
So it's not just like, oh, let's be open-minded and work with others. It's more around, let's really dig into how others work and why they work the way they work and see how we can build bridges to collaborate together. So I think those, those two things would be, are kind of super interesting. And they also need some kind of codification. So how do we codify this, these ways of collaborating? How do we design them in a way that they are maybe in, reproducible in a number of contexts? So almost like, again, like tools, not rules, but a little bit of a guidance, let's say. What, <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious, what would be a good starting point to uh, learn about numbers and PLs and if if a service design professional approaches you right now after this episode and says this sounds great I want to follow up on your advice where would you point them to I don't know because I, I I think there is like a more there's like an increasing hybridization isn't there in at least in education sector so I see a lot of my ex colleagues who have done these like designers kind of MBAs or which also feels a bit tribal because it's you know but but I think also there is a lot of collaboration from, you know, kind of business schools to design organizations and so on. So I think there's an aspect of that, that it's kind of explore these things. But maybe it's just about, you know, learning some some skills of business or business analysis. So I found a lot of skills of uh, done a lot of kind of short courses, maybe on more strategy related stuff, which also has its own kind of tools and frameworks, but also like more granular things like business analysis. You know, sometimes things like forecasting or, or different tools from finance can also be very, very useful to kind of get your mind into that. Hmm. I have a, a blog post with 30 book recommendations for service designers, and I would say 25 of those 30 books aren't about service design. Uh, yeah. And I think that's um, that should be the mantra. Like, uh, you read five books about service design uh, yeah. to... to get yourself familiar with the tools and methods, and then you read 25 other books to familiarize yourself with the people and disciplines you need to be exactly. working with. Yeah. Strategy, communication, uh, absolutely, HR, like those are the things that are going to really help you be effective as a service design professional. Yeah. One thing that I found really useful actually was um, when I went to work in financial sector, this big capability project was reading ethnography about banking, banking industry to kind of understand how things work, what is the culture, how things work in there. So that's more like coming at it from a culture and social dynamics side. But I thought it's it was so helpful to, to kind of, if you are not a native of the industry, to understand some of the quirks and proxies and the way things are there, why they might be like that. So that was another one which I thought like, I think ethnography is like a great way to access understanding about um, the, the nature of things you're going to work with in service design often. And uh, ethnography, like we are pretty good at that, uh, applying it to the end user. We've often said on the show, we also need to apply it to the organizations we, we work for, right? Uh, it shouldn't be that uh, difficult. Now, I'm curious, uh, similar question to, okay, maybe after this conversation, somebody is inspired and wants to start doing this. What, what is a good first step? How do, you, how do you expand your existing perspective on what service design is or could be? Maybe it's what you're saying. Maybe it's almost like if you would take it as a little experiment on yourself, it's almost like... Um, Trying to, trying to look at any case that you are working on, like a service design project or service design, service improvement project, whatever you're on at the minute, and just give it a spin, like, you know, almost like make a map of it and be like, this is what we are working, this is the problem we are solving. But then like, what is around it? Like what is in the context around it? And is there anything else that we could solve for? And it's almost like put it through the process and see what happens. Like, does it work for it? So I think we've, you, you talk a lot also um, about dark matter, yeah? Like the, the politics of things or, um, you know, what kind of conversations are being had? How are people spending their time? So some things that you might not necessarily be looking around, but they are around the context of 
the client situation you might be in. So is there anything that can be done to design for that? And oftentimes, the services that we are working for in the clients are actually sometimes not working because of that, but that's not in the brief. And we just a little bit ignore it at our own risk. Yeah, and uh, usually we ignore it not uh, willfully sometimes, but often it's just uh, a lack of understanding, a lack of knowledge. And uh, uh, while you were describing this, like uh, I saw a different image popping up in my head uh, where we often have the notion to put service design at the center of what we're doing and map the other things around that. While if you put the outcome that you're striving for at the center and make, uh, like if it's a mind map service design, one of the areas that's connected to the, the that outcome, what are the other things connected to the outcome that you are trying to achieve? And like you said, organizational Absolutely. design, HR, employees, uh, uh, suppliers, and that- Absolutely. <laughs> Probably if you start mapping out, what do I know about all these other things? And if you cannot map anything that's related to that outcome, uh, branding, then that's all also a sign that's that you probably don't have uh, the holistic perspective that you may think you have uh, on what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. Um, this, um, I can imagine that this sounds intimidating for some people service design is already so big there are so many things you need to know and it's ever expanding like <clears throat> how do you even grasp and comprehend this what does this mean for a service design professional um i don't know probably not much <laughs> or probably a lot it depends i just think it's nice to think that you know it's nice to remind ourselves as service designers so if you look at it from a you know egocentric perspective now we are putting ourselves in the middle of everything but it's like okay i need a tribe i need an identity i am a service designer right that's the tribe i play in or the team i play in but then it's it's almost like you know how do i expand my playbook and in order to really kick ass at my job what other things can i do to be more impactful exactly as you say outputs are one thing outcomes are a totally different thing and I think it's almost like, you know, we talk about North Star, we give our clients North Star, we help them realize their North Star and kind of build everything that needs to happen underneath to get there. But it's like, how do we apply that to ourselves as service designers to make ourselves more rounded? And I would totally agree with you that, you know, of your list of books or readings or things that you need to, to understand, probably 80% of that is outside just reading about service design and getting good technically. And it's more around everything else that influences it. And how do you leverage those connections? How do you, how do you create a more grounded and maybe useful, and you know, and almost in not in, not something that you could industrialize, but something that you could replicate, um, of go making good collaborations, making kind of straight line collaborations with others in the business who might be completely different from you and kind of keep on expanding that understanding. So I do believe that, you know, I've heard, I've heard people transitioning into service design from, from more visual or like product design disciplines, a little bit complaining that, but we, we are not doing design. You know, it's like, but facilitation is the design. You can design a conversation. You can design this kind of intervention in, in a business where you just ask, the right questions or make people ask the right questions, make people be reflective. So I think if we, you know, if we are open-minded about that, we can still have boundaries to the role, but we can just keep on exploring where we can make an impact. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I, for me, it does. Um, I, and this relates to a question I had here in my notes where, where it's around, where does it end? But, reflecting on that question, I don't think that's the right question to be asking because mm. um, yeah, there is no end to it. Like the thing, uh, the thing that you need to do probably is keep expanding your vocabulary and your skill set to the people you're working with, at, at least uh, 
rephrasing this. So you, in order to know where it stops, you need to know wh which other things are out there and you need to know at which moment um, you need yeah. to call somebody else. Like, okay, I know you need to be aware that branding is there and you need to have a basic understanding of what branding is and their language. And then you need to be able to identify, okay, we've now reached a point in our challenge where I actually need to call a different expert. I think that's where it stops. When you need, when you understand what your own limitations are and know who you need to call next. Yeah. Nice. That's where it stops, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, nice. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Totally. And it also, yeah, it keeps you grounded as well. And it keeps you hoarding everything on your shoulders. But then I was thinking, Mark, what if, um, what if the, the, the discipline of service design had landed a different name? You know, why is it service design? Like, why didn't we get called service planners or, you know, service orchestrators or service developers? It's interesting, yeah. right? That the. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, have a perspective on that. And I still think that uh, the term service design makes a lot of sense and it's yeah. really relevant. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and other terms are also relevant, but I, I definitely see where service design as a term is coming from and why it's still relevant. Yeah. And there's one thing that I was thinking around that as well, which is um, this concept of silent designers. So in every organization, in every kind of, uh, as an agency, you go into a business context and, and then there are people who are designing, but they just don't know that they are designing. And it's like this kind of silent designers who have maybe a very deep understanding of some areas of the business. They are building relationships with other partners inside the business, and they are kind of designing the organization just through their own routines, rituals, behaviors, kind of inquiry. So it's also interesting to 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 almost like not be patronizing and understand that there is actually a lot of design going on in a lot of things that don't have the te term design on their on their title. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. The like. Um, referring back to the coffee shop example, the quote that yeah. uh, a lot of people refer to, uh, I added a note, um, sort of an underline there uh, where I said like service design is a thing that makes you walk into one shop, not the other. The, the update that I gave there is like, it's good service design that makes you walk into the one. Mm. Because I think, like you mentioned, design is already there. Like every organization is already doing design and more specifically already doing service design. Some do it intentionally. Most of them mm. don't. Uh, and a lot of people are already designing things, just don't have yet figured out that there is a name and a discipline and something that they can actually learn and train and improve. Now, heading towards uh, the end of our conversation, I'm curious, we discussed a lot of things, explored a lot. How would you summarize this? This thing that just happened here? This this conversation, <laughs> this last 40 minutes, 45 <laughs> minutes, how would you summarize this? Besides very stressful, um, just re reflective, like I think, I I guess it's my, my very simple message is that it just kind of reminds me that collaboration is everything. So focusing on understanding the limits of what you can do and just working with others is maybe the most kind of instrumental thing that we need to learn designing services or organizations or whatever we are doing and and then i guess this conversation has just made me reflect on the fact that we we still tend to reward individual achievement all the time when in fact the most powerful thing we have at our you know, as, as a kind of social entities and collectives, organizations, businesses, public sector, whatever, is collaboration. And the fact that we all have different points of view, different skill sets, different capabilities. So I think harnessing the power of that is, is probably the most important thing and refining that versus still being caught up in this sort of rewarding individual achievement, even though actually we kind of understand that what we should be rewarding is collaboration, but we just don't really know how to. Mm. And, and that's a, that's a really good uh, insight and happy that uh, you sort of uh, were able to pick on this. And I think in order to, this is one of those areas where we need to understand, okay, this isn't the area of service design. We need to go to organization designers for this, for instance. Uh, 
Um, and uh, incentives are uh, a huge uh, element of how we do things, why we do things, why things are structured. And like you said, if if the incentives within an organization are to reward individual contributions, then it makes sense that we create silos and that uh, we we form tribes. So um, maybe uh, maybe th we need to see seek the solution in different areas than in our own or next to our own discipline. Yeah. Now, one final question nice. I had uh, before uh, we lo leave off. You've been, again, you've been thinking a lot about this, but what's the one thing you wished you knew five years ago about the mm -hmm. journey that you uh, have gone through right now? Yeah, I think it's um, something about not being scared to just be really clueless <laughs> and ask a really kind of um, clueless question. So just be confident in in not knowing, I guess. And be confident that the, the inquiry is like the thing that matters. So adaptability and all that. Sometimes you get hung up. Like I don't want to be get. I don't want to be caught out. I don't want to to seem like the most clueless person in the room. It doesn't matter. I think that's yeah. But is that isn't that the catch twenty two? Could you have done? Yeah. Can, can you do uh, this? No. <laughs> it's like this is like the power of hindsight. You know, <laughs> it's so easy. Easier said than done. But I think, um, yeah, I think that's that's the that's the bit where where I just wish, you know, I'm I'm kind of like, I have like a bucket of all the questions that I didn't ask that I wish I had asked, kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah, and the sooner you arrive at the uh, inside that it's okay not to know, uh, like that, the, the better. So, uh, you have. I, I I agree with you. You you probably have to go through that experience. Um, this isn't something you learn out of a textbook where somebody says it's okay not yeah. to know. You actually have to go through that experience. But the sooner you arrive there, probably the sooner you'll find enlightenment and release and yeah. relief. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and you. It doesn't apply to everything, right? Like you still find yourself in situations where it's like everything comes tumbling down, but. It's almost like a muscle, no? That you you just keep building. That okay, I'm gonna. It's gonna be okay. It's yeah. And we'll figure kind it of. out. Yeah, we'll yeah. figure it. Out. It's it's we'll okay. We'll figure it out. Um, Clara, uh, thank you for this conversation. Uh, a lot thank of you. things uh, emerged. Uh, a lot of probably new questions uh, arrived, and uh, that's exactly what we try to do here on the show: raising new questions rather than giving answers. Uh, so yeah. Thanks again for coming on, Thank sharing you. what's been on your mind and sharing this with the community. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. We're almost at the end of this conversation. I really hope that you enjoyed it and got something useful out of it. And if you did, make sure to leave a short comment down below. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll catch you very soon in the next video.